Good afternoon. My name is Hans Liu, and I'm an infectious diseases physician by training. I would say that some of the most common reasons that I'm consulted are skin and soft tissue infections, severe bacteremias, and pneumonia. When pneumonia is in an immunocompromised host, diagnosis becomes more difficult and treatment more complicated. I was asked to speak today on highlights of pneumonias in the immunocompromised host. I want to start with some comments from Sir McFarlane Burney, who's an Australian immunologist who received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1960. He pointed out that the immune system is the reason that people don't become infected from the many pathogens in our environment. And to paraphrase him, he said it's more remarkable that people stay well than that they become ill with infections. Now, today, in the next half hour, we'll look at the many different types of immunocompromise you may encounter. And I will begin very broadly with some mechanical defects, such as mucociliary dysfunction, which predisposes to sinopulmonary infections. We'll also talk about specific immune defects, since this is a key principle in predicting what kind of infection an immunocompromised host might develop. We'll discuss approaching the sick immunocompromised host because there are certain things that you want to determine, including the reasons for the immunocompromise uh, and any prior exposures or vaccinations they may have had. We'll give specific examples of bacterial, viral, fungal, mycobacterial, and protozoan etiologies which illustrate some of these immune defects and their consequences. We'll then summarize with some ideas about management of the immunocompromised host or the possibly immunocompromised host with pneumonia, and finally finish up with some conclusions and suggestions. Now, it turns out that there are many risks for respiratory infections, and one of them um, uh, in a specific patient is to consider what time of the year it is and what kind of infections may be in the environment. For example, influenza tends to circulate at the same, same time each year. Respiratory syncytial virus may be more sporadic. And unfortunately, as we've all discovered, COVID-19, uh, once it's established, can be present at any time. And it's very important to ask patients and family members about possible exposure to this. Uh, in addition, a individual's environment may predispose them to respiratory infections. For example, crowded living conditions increases the rate of respiratory infections. Also, I note that uh, pneumococcal uh, pneumonia due to strep pneumonia resistant to penicillin and other antibiotics was first detected in otherwise healthy gold miners in South Africa who were prone to working in very hot, very humid conditions in the gold mines. Now, it turns out that there are also um, behavioral factors. I think all of the people in the audience have dealt with smokers and realize that smoking is a significant risk for the development of respiratory infections, uh, both acute and chronic. And then aspiration is a concern. Uh, one thought is that most pneumonias are at least in part due to aspiration, probably subclinical, but we've all seen examples of acute uh, and chronic aspiration due to diminished levels of consciousness uh, or a, uh, impaired gag reflex. Now, it's important to look at the type of immunocompromise in order to predict what kind of infections uh, may be developing. And one of them is structural defects of the respiratory tract. And these range from microscopic, where there's decreased uh, mucociliary clearance of the airways, all the way up to um, a large airway obstruction by, for example, an endobronchial tumor or a foreign body. Impaired humoral immunity can be inborn, and this is the case with types of hypogammaglobulinemia, uh, 
It can be seen as part of a malignant condition. Uh, for example, patients with multiple myeloma produce large amounts of antibody, but it's largely ineffective, and they're therefore prone to infections due to lack of antibody function. Uh, or you can acquire uh, impaired humoral immunity, and this is something that occurs when B cells, which produce antibody, are severely suppressed by chemotherapy. Another form of immunosuppression is impaired cellular immunity. And when T cells are involved, uh, for example, in uh, HIV infection or organ transplantation or the suppression of graft versus, graft versus host reactions, uh, then you tend to see uh, pathogens which are uh, become opportunistic in the absence of T cell function. Uh, granulocytopenia is commonly encountered uh, with chemotherapy. And when the granulocytes, which are very active against pyogenic organisms like streptococci, staphylococci, uh, and certain gram negatives, you see infections and sometimes overwhelming infections with these organisms. Uh, and one thing that, that we note is that mixed immune dysfunction uh, is relatively commonly encountered. Uh, for example, when an individual has an immune problem, uh, such as a malignancy, and then receives immunosuppression as part of their therapy, they're likely to have defects in multiple uh, areas of the immune system. Now, not all uh, immune-related uh, pneumonias are managed in the hospital. However, because these patients are frequently debilitated with multiple diagnoses and are often quite sick, uh, many of these cases are uh, treated in the hospital setting, especially the ICU, or develop in the hospital as in hospital-acquired pneumonias or ventilator-associated pneumonias. Uh, this uh, pie chart shows a review of the pathogens associated with hospital-acquired pneumonia and ventilator-acquired pneumonia from the Century study, uh, which was conducted in the United States. It's an ongoing study, and this information is from 2016, and shows that while Staph aureus was responsible for approximately 30% of hospital-acquired pneumonias, Pseudomonas aeruginosa was not far behind at 24%, and other gram-negatives, including Klebsiella, E. coli, Acinetobacter and Enterobacter species were often commonly encountered. So these are some of the organisms to think about in immunocompromised pneumonia, where the patient uh, winds up being hospitalized or develops the infection in the hospital. Now, there are associations of specific immune defects with particular pathogens. And as I said, this is one of the principles uh, in uh, anticipating and making a diagnosis of infections in these types of hosts. For example, um, we've already mentioned structural defects, such as the inability to clear respiratory secretions. Uh, and this tends to predispose to bacterial infections with streptococci, staphylococci, and many gram-negative pathogens. For example, in cystic fibrosis, uh, these organisms are able to grow in the obstructing secretions, uh, and repetitive courses of antibiotics tend to select for multidrug-resistant pseudomonas or stenotrophomonas. Impaired hum uh, humoral immunity due to poor uh, antibody levels or function is a risk factor for encapsulated organisms. These include things like the pneumococcus, uh, as well as haemophila species. And these are often causes of recurrent infection, uh, such as sinusitis or recurrent pneumonia. Impaired cellular immunity leads to opportunistic infections with many, many different organisms that are generally less pathogenic in healthy individuals. These include Legionella, pneumocystis species, a variety of fungi, many viruses, and mycobacteria. And it should be pointed out that many of these organisms uh, can multiply uh, intracellularly, and therefore T cells are extremely important in their control and clearance. And uh, we've mentioned granulocytopenia, and this is the uh, lack of uh, polymorphonuclear, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. And at this point, uh, Staph aureus uh, from the skin and gram-negatives, often from the GI tract, 
become predominant pathogens. And as we mentioned, that there are many uh, mixed immune defects, uh, for example, uh, broad uh, chemotherapy. Uh, but in addition, in the current uh, COVID pandemic, it's been, aver it's been observed that coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, tends to uh, probably trigger uh, some specific immune as well as thrombotic defects. And then when patients are treated with immunosuppression uh, to, uh, to fight the inflammatory features of COVID-19, uh, immunosuppression uh, is worsened. Now, when it comes to assessing the sick immunocompromised patient, it's very important to take a careful history, asking about malignancy, even suspected malignancy, and also processes such as COPD or rheumatologic conditions that might require immunosuppressive treatment uh, are important to determine. Uh, also, make sure that the patients have received appropriate uh, preventative measures, these include uh, vaccinations against viruses such as influenza in season uh, and, uh, uh, and certainly uh, COVID-19 and among bacteria, uh, treatment uh, with uh, pneumococcal vaccine, including the most up-to-date forms. Also, when you decide on a treatment location, uh, recall that hospitalization is not automatically necessary, but if the patient is extremely debilitated, the uh, immunosuppression is extremely severe, such as profound, profound granulocytopenia, uh, or if objective parameters such as O2 saturation indicate the patient may require hospitalization. If another service, for example, an oncology service or a, a rheumatology service is involved in the prescribing of the immunosuppressive medications, uh, be sure they're involved in the assessment uh, and the dosing of the immunosuppressive uh, treatments. Uh, and finally, it's critically important to obtain smears and cultures and decide on a course of diagnostic procedures, for example, bronchoscopy and lung biopsy, uh, as early as possible. This allows the prompt institution of empiric antibiotics, which can be extremely important in patients who lack the ability to fight the infection themselves. Uh, note also that uh, serologic testing is probably somewhat less useful than in the normal, uh, normally immune host, uh, because serologic tests take a bit of time to develop, uh, and furthermore, patients with immunosuppression uh, may not develop the appropriate serologic response. And always remember that you should take advantage of the advanced diagnostic tests that have come uh, online within the past few years. These include some uh, PCR-based assays looking for specific pathogens, uh, genomic tests that can, uh, within uh, minutes to hours, identify um, uh, specific pathogens, and even hint at antimicrobial resistance patterns uh, from clinical specimens uh, even before culture results become available. Now, this is an example of one of these uh, panels. This is a uh, respiratory pathogen panel which came into use at my hospital uh, quite a few years ago. And I tend to show it because it was one of uh, the first panels that we had and made the diagnosis of a coronavirus infection. This was in 2016, prior to COVID-19. It occurred in a friend of mine who was a very strong, very healthy nurse, and she uh, developed a um, community-acquired uh, COVID HKU1 infection. Uh, despite our best efforts at symptomatic treatment, and we were able to avoid starting antibacterials because we had the diagnosis of a coronavirus infection, uh, despite all that supportive care and cough suppression, uh, she required hospitalization, and even when discharged, relapsed and required rehospitalization. Furthermore, her daughter, who was a college student, took time off from school to come home and help take care of her mother, and she became infected and required hospitalization. So uh, without knowing it, we had a preview uh, of what we saw with so many patients and families uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the bottom line is that uh, COVID-19 uh, is a bad pathogen, uh, and uh, it can be a particularly bad pathogen 
in patients with some degree of immunosuppression, even relative ones like type 2 diabetes mellitus or cardiac conditions, and it can be quite devastating in individuals who have significant uh, immunosuppression. Now, I wanted to move to certain specific uh, pathogens. Uh, I thought the group would also enjoy uh, seeing, uh, instead of just words on slides, starting to see chest x-rays and CT scans uh, and even some pathologic specimens. We mentioned structural and mechanical defects. Uh, and for example, this is a presentation of a patient who complained of fever, uh, coughing, uh, and lower chest pain on the right side. It's a common presentation. We, we see it many times a, a month and sometimes many times a week. Uh, and it can be the presentation of a community-acquired pneumonia, such as pneumococcus, which can occur in healthy individuals. However, it can also be the presentation of aspiration pneumonia uh, or an inhaled foreign body with post-obstructive pneumonia. Uh, and after a viral infection, such as influenza or such as uh, COVID-19, it can be due to a bacterial superinfection. And for example, uh, after influenza pneumonia, uh, Staph aureus uh, is a major pathogen. In severely immunocompromised patients, uh, this can be the initial presentation of a gram-negative pneumonia, such as Klebsiella. Uh, and so, uh, with this simple x-ray, uh, a variety of diagnoses, including uh, pneumonia and the immunocompromised host, may be made. Now, this uh, furthermore looks at the sputum findings and aspiration pneumonia. As I think all of you know, the studies may be non-diagnostic. There's no um, predominant pathogen. In this particular smear, um, you can see... Uh, Protonaceous material, uh, cocci, rods, some gram positive, some gram negative, and the occasional uh, polymorphonuclear leukocyte. And the laboratory would often report the culture results as showing normal oral flora. Uh, similarly, um, if you treat these individuals, uh, they may improve but not completely resolve their symptoms until the obstruction. Uh, is relieved uh, in the cases of tumor, sometimes by radiation therapy, in the case of a foreign body or a major obstruction, sometimes by an invasive bronco bronchoscopic or surgical procedure. This is a CT scan showing a post-obstructive pneumonia, in this case a mass obstructing one of the bronchi. Uh, the presentation and the organisms, uh, as we mentioned, may be similar for both aspiration pneumonia and post-obstructive pneumonia, uh, as it tends to be uh, oral pharyngeal flora that gets into the lungs either by aspiration or develops into an infection because of inability to clear uh, respiratory secretions in the case of obstruction. Uh, and as already mentioned, uh, sometimes uh, a procedure is required for diagnosis and radiation therapy or a procedure to relieve the obstruction may be necessary to affect recovery. Uh, viral pneumonias uh, can be both community-acquired uh, and seen in immunocompromised hosts. Uh, we certainly see influenza pneumonia in season. Uh, RSV can present as pneumonia. Many of these patients now are diagnosed in the office or in the emergency department and managed uh, symptomatically or with an antiviral drug such as oseltamivir in the outpatient setting. Uh, however, um, recall again that COVID-19, while it does not present with pneumonia in the majority of patients, can uh, show the classic ground glass opacities uh, in a significant percentage, uh, perhaps 15 or 20 percent in some studies. And while recovery is possible, a proportion of these patients will go on uh, to severe widespread pneumonia and whiteout. So this is, again, something else to be uh, aware of. Now, when a patient is immunocompromised uh, by something such as bone marrow transplantation, now you see a variety of pneumonias, pneumonia such as cytomegalovirus cause severe infection, and these often are disseminated uh, diffuse infections with respiratory failure. And recall again that viruses can be co-pathogens uh, either with bacteria or leading the way to bacteria 
by severely damaging the lung. Now, pneumocystis is a very interesting pathogen. Uh, it actually uh, was and probably still is uh, a community-acquired organism. It was first reported after World War II in severely malnourished refugees. When I was a resident in training at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City in the 1970s, uh, I remember uh, we asked a medical student what the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia was, uh, with us, the, the residents, expecting uh, the student to say uh, pneumococcus or strep pneumoniae. And the student thought about it and said, well, it must be pneumocystis. Uh, and we thought about it and said, in that patient population, which was almost exclusively cancer patients, uh, the, the student was correct. And we were seeing a great deal of pneumocystis well prior to the HIV epidemic. Now, at that time, immunocompromised hosts, for example, those with lymphoma, who had been receiving chemotherapy, including steroids and possibly radiation therapy, would blossom pneumocystis with a classic butterfly pattern on chest X-ray and severe hypoxemia as the steroid component of therapy was tapered. Uh, later, of course, with the advent of HIV and AIDS, pneumocystis was a common uh, respiratory infection. And it's, important, it's an important diagnosis to make uh, or at least to think about because the, or the uh, treatments for pneumocystis are quite specific, including things like trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and other drugs, uh, which would not necessarily be part of an empiric regimen uh, unless you're thinking of the possibility of pneumocystis. Now, invasive fungal organisms are one thing that many of us worry about uh, because of their high morbidity and mortality. Fungi are present everywhere in the environment in soil, uh, and they're relatively uncommon causes of serious infection in healthy hosts. However, corticoster uh, corticosteroid therapy can predispose to fungal lung infections or, or just colonization. And when you have severe immunosuppression, you start to see things like aspergillus species and related fungi become uh, serious infections with invasion uh, and respiratory dysfunction. Uh, the slide uh, shows a CT scan with a solitary aspergilloma. Uh, this can occur due to aspergillus infection. In this particular case, uh, the patient uh, had a prior history of tuberculosis, and so this was a mycobacterial cavity colonized by aspergillus. The lower CT scans, uh, one a coronal uh, uh, of the skull, shows mucor, which has become a common pathogen in India and other parts of the world, probably due to environmental prevalence of mucor. It shows that it's often sinopulmonary, uh, in the sinuses and may invade the orbit, and then, of course, can also invade the lung and, and sometimes the brain. So that severe immunosuppression, uh, in the case of, for example, COVID-19 and mucor, or chemotherapy and aspergillus, uh, is another combination that leads to severe uh, immunocompromised patient pneumonia. Now, this is uh, the pathologic findings of aspergillus pneumonia. You see a H&E smear of lung tissue with the fungus invading uh, with the uh, classic uh, acute angle branching. Now remember that aspergillus is part of a continuum. It can cause colonization, uh, for example, in a, a user of inhaled or systemic steroids. It can cause bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is largely an asthmatic uh, allergic phenomenon. Uh, it can cause fungus balls, as we saw in the previous CT scan. And unfortunately, with severe immunosuppression, it causes this kind of tissue invasive disease and destruction. Now, the slide uh, also notes uh, that while it's invasive, it's usually not recovered from blood uh, because it tends to be thrombotic uh, and uh, destroys tissue without bloodstream invasion. Uh, and finally, I, I chose this slide of mycobacteria because of the, the particular uh, coloring that the radiology department chose to highlight the abnormalities. Uh, 
I think everyone knows that mycobacteria, even non-tuberculous species, can cause primary disease in a variety of hosts, including uh, fairly healthy individuals. Uh, when you do see significant disease, it's often reactivation uh, brought on by immunosuppressive therapies such as steroids or a uh, new infection. Um, <clears throat> Non-tuberculous mycobacteria, that is, uh, other than Mycobacterium tuberculosis, include MAI, which was uh, commonly seen in uh, HIV-infected individuals, and there's a whole variety of them uh, which vary in their degree of invasiveness uh, and pathogenicity. Now, one problem that all of the, or most of the mycobacteria share uh, is resistance to antimicrobial agents. Uh, and this is a treatment issue. Uh, I think that at least two of the major causes of um, uh, multidrug resistance and extreme drug resistance in tuberculosis and related diseases is poor compliance with uh, regular medication on the part of the individual or uh, immunocompromise and inability to uh, kill or contain the organism uh, despite the presence of effective anti-TB therapy. Now, so I promise to uh, give a couple of comments about managing the sick immunocompromised patient. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on diagnosis because I think that there's a good body of literature talking about evidence-based medicine and appropriate uh, regimens for treatment of many of these diagnoses uh, once you have achieved a diagnosis. I will point out that prompt institution of antimicrobials is important once you've uh, uh, determined that the individual is immunocompromised and has pneumonia, and also uh, adjusting this therapy when a diagnostic test such as a culture or a rapid uh, identification uh, assay becomes positive. Uh, also, uh, remember that uh, it's best to make sure that cultures are at least pending uh, before starting therapy that might obscure any growth in the culture. Now, clinical guidelines may be quite helpful uh, in the management of these patients. I always remind uh, my students and residents that the guidelines are only a starting point. So they're not intended to be a cookbook that tells you that you do A, B, and C, and then you're finished. They're a guide to what you should consider, and you should modify that based on uh, what you're seeing in the patient and how the patient is progressing on treatment. A reversal of the immunosuppression uh, may be quite helpful, and I mentioned coordinating uh, treatment with the a primary service, uh, if there is one that's uh, giving the steroids or the uh, cancer chemotherapy. Uh, for example, one can taper the uh, steroid therapy or one can add uh, GCSF to enhance the return of white blood cells. I will point out that uh, in my early uh, years in practice, uh, GCSF came out and I said, good, this will mean we have shorter periods of granulocytopenia to get the patients through. And my oncology colleague said, no, we're going to use the GCSF to allow us to give more intensive chemotherapy and improve the number of uh, responses or remissions that we see in our patients. Uh, in addition, uh, once the patient is improved, particularly if you think the infection is eradicated, taper the antibiotics as tolerated, perhaps with somewhat uh, more caution than in a perfectly healthy individual who has intact immune def uh, defenses. Uh, but nonetheless, if you're able to get the patient off of antibiotics, uh, this will help the individual patient with less toxicity, less chance of resistance, and it's likely to help your overall population and your healthcare institution uh, with less problems with um, resistant microorganisms. So finally, in the last slide, I think we can all agree from the previous review that infections, notably pneumonia, are challenging to diagnose and manage in the immunocompromised patient. Keep in mind that uh, mild to moderate immune impairment may be present, and it's important to ask 
patients, for example, if they've received a recent course of corticosteroids for any reason, and that a severe immunocompromise may present with an opportunistic infection. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, HIV-positive individual who comes in with something like pneumocystis or even severe uh, pharyngeal candida. Uh, work systematically to evaluate immunocompromised individuals. We talked about looking at history, exposures, vaccinations. All of these things may be important in choosing therapy and uh, uh, guiding diagnoses. Uh, and take new advantages in diagnostic testing. We've talked about some of these uh, rapid assays in therapeutic agents because there are some new uh, antibiotics and, and even new agents such as monoclonal antibodies that are coming online. Uh, and also our understanding of the immune function, uh, which is not only in the classically immunocompromised patient, such as the cancer patient, but also the COVID patient, where immunocompromise may be part of the COVID infection or part of the, uh, the treatment. So with that, I'll thank everybody for their attention. Uh, and I think we're planning to have a question and answer uh, period after this. Again, thank you very much for listening.